Hi, this is Sabrina Monarch of Monarch Astrology bringing you the astrology forecast for September 30th to October 6th, 2020. We have a full moon in Aries conjunct Chiron, the planet of healing and the sacred wound, the medicine that is within the wound. We have Venus entering Virgo and Pluto will station direct in Capricorn. So I'm going to share my screen and my slides. Welcome back if you've been watching these forecasts. And if you're new here, I'm an evolutionary astrologer and a clairvoyant, and I've been writing astrology forecasts at monarchastrology.com. Um, I'm on my sixth year now of writing weekly content. And I recently branched out to YouTube to share video versions. And uh, my approach to astrology is to name the subtleties of any given moment, name some of the conflicts or impasses that may be coming up and offer suggestions or insight on how to both work through some of those conflicts and also to talk about the subtle energies and the opportunities that are present in any given moment so that we can increase our communion with the cosmos through this beautiful language of astrology. And it's also really important to me to bring, you know, a deep kind of psychological dive and a you know, I come from a soul work approach, but I'm really um, intent on not being fear-based and in myself to consistently work through my own stuff um, so that the filter that I bring to the transits is um, always on my cutting edge and um, tuned in hopefully as well to what is coming up for you. So let's begin. Um, you can always find these forecasts in written version at monarchastrology.com, by the way. So we have a full moon in Aries this week, followed by Venus entering Virgo and Pluto stationing direct in Capricorn. Aries and Virgo are both these highly independent energies. Aries is capable of confronting challenges and setting off on the hero's journey alone. Uh, though one may encounter guides and friends along the way, Aries doesn't need that friend along to say yes to the adventure. And Virgo is a one in herself energy. Virgo is represented by the Virgin in the Zodiac. She's uh, meticulous and discerning, and she chooses her interactions carefully. She's already one in herself. But it's not just a full moon in Aries that we have, it's a full moon in Aries conjunct the asteroid Chiron, signifying that the full brightness of self, the I am energy of Aries, is also shedding light on a core wound around selfhood, as well as the medicine within that wound. Take, for example, any sense of inferiority, which is a common Aries pain point, or not feeling good enough. Within this, is it not a richer sense of self-confidence that's wanting to be birthed? Aries is where we delight in having a personal self, in feeling alive in our essence. It also represents the tenderness of what's new in us. These things that are so fresh about our identity that we lack reflection on it from others, or we have yet to internalize the reflections that we are getting. It's not like a very stable or integrated part of our self-image necessarily. Or perhaps um, these actions that we might take largely unaware of how they're going to be received by others and by the field around us because we literally just don't know. It's kind of like throwing something at the wall and seeing if it sticks. Um, we don't have the experience yet to inform us about cause and effect in these arenas. So this might be a new part of yourself that you don't let people see very often. And so when you do bring it out, you're like, what's going to happen? It's, it's an experiment. So this is quite vulnerable. On the other hand, there is also that side of Aries that like secretly knows that they're the hero of the story and they're just waiting for everyone else to see it and recognize it too. Um, it can go either way and sometimes be a mix of both. So this week, um, what I want you to look out for, there can be a burgeoning or perhaps bursting desire this week to feel a way about ourselves, whether that's self-esteem or confidence or feeling pleasure in our existence in some way that we have felt disconnected from of late. 
There is that phrase, wherever you go, there you are. So we might be chasing a variety of different experiences or material successes or possessions, hoping that once we achieve or have the thing that we'll feel the way that we want to. And sometimes we even succeed, but this feeling that we were chasing doesn't linger. It's off to the next thing. The self too is not a static object, nor a static object that can be predicted. Discovering and being with ourselves is a moment to moment process. I have my friend Cameron Allen, when I say moment to moment, hearing him be moment, 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 moment from a recent um, Mars retrograde talk that he did. So that is like Aries, it's just moment, 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 moment. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What are my impulses now? 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 Like that is just a constant drumbeat. And the satisfaction of feeling connected to ourselves then comes with this capacity to keep entering each frame of time, each moment, and finding out who we are now. Not who we will be or who we were, but who we are right now. And this is a sense of unification. And this is, you know, the unification of self with self as opposed to a self divided or having abandoned oneself or putting oneself on a shelf for later. And, you know, back to this idea about chasing success. I'm not even like shaming that idea. Um, I myself am a very ambitious person and also an Aries son, by the way. Um, so it's not exactly that chasing something is wrong, but can you be present with yourself in the, the chasing? It's when we fracture ourselves in the process and we're delaying gratification that we run into some more, um, I guess, problematic qualities of this archetype. Um, whereas if you can feel the fullness of being in the process, then there's this kind of romance with life that is allowed to unfold in that moment, as opposed to feeling a sense of longing and wanting life to be something other than it is, or wanting ourselves to be something other than who we are. So having ambition can be true, and we can feel good about ourselves for going for what we really want in life. But how can we relate to where we are now that brings fulfillment into our lives, into our inner world? So tune into the movements in your inner world um, this week for clues as to how yourself is essentially wanting to be seen and engaged with. The moon also represents nostalgia, generally. So it's possible that we will be drawn to thinking of past victories, past peak experiences, um, times in the past that we felt especially self-connected. Look behind these memories though, and it's quite likely that these are moments that you actually just felt really in touch with the moment, that there wasn't a very thick barrier between you and the moment that you were living out in time, the phase of your life. There was like a... Um, fully throwing yourself into life quality. So it's not what you were doing. It's not the form it took. It's that you were in this deeper gnosis with your impulses and your own cutting edge, that you were involved thoroughly with the moment. The same can happen now, it can happen again, um, but the entrance into that realm is different and it must be discovered. So here's our week again, after a few announcements. That's the intro to this week's transits. Um, first, please go ahead and like this video and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you, are, you stay apprised of all upcoming videos. Um, let me know what your reflections are throughout watching or afterwards. I love to hear from you. I um, teach an evolutionary astrology intensive and I'll be announcing the dates for the next one soon. I know I keep saying that every week, but the, the horizon of announcing it is getting closer. Um, I 
you know, this is an amazing course. I'm going to leave the link to the course um, in the notes. Um, the dates aren't up yet, but you can just see um, what the curriculum is and read some testimonials from past students. Um, the course is currently in session. And also, my books for astrology readings um, are closed. I'm booked out. But if you get on my mailing list, you'll be the first to find out when my books open up again. And I'm still taking on new clients for ongoing mentorship. So a six month or one year mentorship relationship. And if you're interested in that, you can send me an email at sabrina at monarchastrology.com to set up a free consultation call and just let me know what's coming up for you in life, why you're seeking mentorship, and we can get on a call to see if it's a good fit. And in other news, I have a new episode of Magic of the Spheres out, and this is The Alchemy of Non-Anxious Presence with Julie Hahn. Um, I wanted to ask Julie, she took the intensive in January of 2019, and I wanted to share her story here of working in a hospital um, as a chaplain and how she brought Reiki into the hospital. I think that this episode contains a lot of gems um, for any moment in time, but also especially in this kind of Martian heavy astrology that we're having right now with Mars retrograde and Mars square Saturn and Pluto for basically the rest of the year. Um, that, you know, being non-reactive or having a non-anxious presence as a form of mitigating or transforming crisis um, is powerful. And it's a very inspiring story as well. Um, I enjoyed this conversation and you can tune into it where you listen to podcasts. So I hope too that the sound, my computer's like buzzing, like it's overheated right now. And I haven't figured out how to, to soothe it, um, but I hope that that buzzing isn't coming through. Anyway, here's our week. So on October 1st, 2020, the full moon in Aries occurs. It'll be in nine degrees of Aries at 2.05 p.m. And I have a quote from Ariel Siegel who wrote, Open and Clothed for the Passionate Clothes Lover, which is a book that I've become obsessed with in the last week or two. And so this quote is, personal style as I understand it means coming to grips with who you really are, not creating a convincing veneer. So the moon is conjunct Chiron and Aries and the two are opposite the sun and Libra. Know that a full moon is always the sun and moon in opposite signs, just as the new moon is always the sun and moon in the same. So last week, um, in the last forecast, which you can find just on the written version because I wasn't here on YouTube last week. Um, I went over Sun and Libra opposite Chiron and Aries. And you can read more about that delineation in last week's forecast. I'll leave the link in the notes. And I talked a lot about jealousy in that. Um, so if you want to read more about that, that's in last week's. It's really interesting, actually, to talk about jealousy um, because it's one of those things that if you do like self-inquiry or personal development, you've probably confronted your own jealousy. And sometimes we can feel as though we've mastered certain things like, oh, I'm not jealous anymore. I don't experience envy anymore. But then these things, these lessons cycle. So it may come back up and you're feeling envious and you're like, what is this about? And I felt that this Libra Aries polarity has a lot to do with that because Libra is about relationship and the way that, you know, it'll, at a deep level, we call in people to our lives that represent energies that are being birthed in us. And we transform and take on new qualities because of our relationship, our relationships. And there is a translation process that has to occur where you aren't the exact image that you see in the mirror in another person. Someone may have a quality that you yourself, you know, you experience your own limits. You're like, I'm never going to be that, that this other person is. And you admire that quality. And there can be a sense of angst with that. Um, and so there has to be this kind of translation of what is this person showing me in the mirror about myself that I do have access to? What's my version of this energy? It may not look exactly the same as this other person's because I'm not them, but what is it that's wanting to emerge in me? And 
you know, it's a process. So sometimes we get triggered by another person in some sense and we're wondering, okay, what is, what's coming through me that I'm being activated by this interaction? So I'm going to read another quote, a longer one from this book. And this is a book about beauty and fashion, and it's like a deep read. I was calling in, um, like praying literally for a, a good kind of like read that goes really deep into questions around fashion and body image and beauty. Um, and then I found this at a thrift store and was super compelled by it. Um, so this as context, yeah, it's a book about fashion, but it goes deeper into the self and self-discovery um, with fashion as that gateway. So here's the quote. The broader and deeper the self-image, the better choices you make because you know who you are in your entirety. How to begin to observe. Mosh Feldenkrais. I don't know if I said that right. A specialist in integrating body and self observed. Our self-image consists of four components involved in every action, movement, sensation, feeling, and thought. This sentiment could use some unpacking. In order to know ourselves, we need to be aware of our body in motion and the range of possible motions, possible movements, what suits us in moving and what does not. With regard to sensation, we might begin to explore what we enjoy feeling and what we do not. Touch, smell, sight, sound, gravity, and muscular resistance. We might begin to experiment with sensations we haven't felt before. Feel your body move through space as you walk and rest. Touch different fabrics, smell flowers, see art. Seek out any pleasure you normally avoid. Enjoyment is perhaps the most important sensation to explore because our peculiar, peculiarly Puritan rooted society places such suspicion on freedom of joy. We often have less range there than we do other emotions, say anger. It's useful to ask again and again, what does pleasure mean to me? And to listen for the answer, looking to develop a kind of virtuoso flexibility with sensation. Feeling might be meant here as emotion, the range of emotional experiences. It is especially useful to explore happiness, contentment, equanimity, balance, and calm. How do you feel those things? How do you sustain these feelings? How can you reconnect to those states once the connection has been broken? How fast can you reconnect? Thought is also a world unto itself. As you move through space, tracking movement, sensation, and feeling, how do you use your mind? How do you direct your thoughts? When do your thoughts ramble off on their own? What do you enjoy thinking about? So this is from Ariel Siegel. Feel like into that texture of just expanded self-awareness, not just the question of who I am, but how do I experience sensation? How do I experience being alive? So at a basic level, this lunation emphasizes painful or negative feeling that comes with comparing oneself to others, as well as the brightness of esteem that comes from fully accepting who we are. A pain point of Aries, as highlighted by the conjunction of the moon to Chiron, is wanting to be number one and a person feeling that they fall short of this status at least in some area of life, and then this sparking feelings of inferiority. Not being number one implies placing oneself on a hierarchical order according to some talents and qualities of other people. No, and we can do this with ourselves where we already feel like number one. We're still creating these hierarchies. From the individual perspective of simply being oneself, one is already number one. Everyone is already their number one, um, but the standards are self-oriented and these standards can only be known by knowing the self. 
And in Libra season in particular, our attention is often on the other, our interactions and our relationships. Libran experiences most always invite a new self-image. We discover a new version of ourselves through all experiences and people that we meet. So this can go a variety of ways. We can be um, comparing ourselves and feeling that sense of hierarchy of who's better, where am I on this hierarchy and like that kind of thing. And we can also be really deeply flattered by the encounter of people in our lives that we value so much. And it's, um, it inspires us that someone like that, you know, is part of our lives and how to just experience that, the humility perhaps that comes from that bright reflection without going into a hierarchical narrative of that person's better than me or I'm better than that person and that whole thing. Which Libra is actually pretty good at being equal. Like Libra, um, it's, it's not exactly a Libra in quality to play that game of who's better, but Aries does that. Aries is competitive and Given that the moon is conjunct Chiron, it's like this kind of thing. If there's some unresolved tension there or some pain point there would potentially come up. So I love this quote um, by Anais Nin um, on this kind of Libra Aries axis of each friend represents a world in us, a world possibly not born until they arrive. And it is only by meeting, and it is only by this meeting that a new world is born. So there are healing potentials in finding where we identify with our experience. So how textures feel under our fingertips, what, you know, what we're smelling, how we feel moving through space, like at that basic kind of level and creating, you know, letting that be a multi-textured fabric of all these different kinds of input that you're receiving about yourself and your experience. Um, how we identify with the people around us, tuning into that and our environment and how our, our experiences and our interactions land in our body and psyche personally. When registered as self-awareness, it becomes more like art or like a personal theater. It's not just an experience that's happening. It's not out there, but it's a clue as to the mystery of who we are and who we are becoming. In experiences of comparison, to come back to that, the personal richness of self-experience is distorted through a lens of hierarchy and competition, which is actually an illusion and unnecessary. I know it's, it's complex in the sense that there are structures in society that have hierarchy in them. And so there are structures that work through hierarchy. It's not that hierarchy is like completely unreal in experience, but in our perception of ranking, that's illusory. If we can hold the listening and experience of another Libra with our own self-awareness, Aries, it is as Anais Nin expresses, a birth of a new world. So this is something that you may find me talking about in general on my platforms, this kind of honing a romantic perception, um, feeling the romance, the eroticism of your own life. And there's something here when it comes to self-awareness and taking in the textures and fabrics of your life and appreciating them and taking them personally to the degree that is right for you where it opens up that romantic perception that theater that sense that your life is beautiful and beauty can be found um you know i'm aware that it's it's a gloomy time it's a gloomy zeitgeist and beauty is something that we have to get very creative about um, in times like this or in personal times um, 
where we are struggling or don't have a lot of access. But there's something about taking the world personally and really feeling how it lands with us that makes it different than seeing something beautiful and feeling like we can't have it or coveting it versus already having experienced that beauty landing in our experience just because we were in the presence of it and witnessed it and felt it. And on October 2nd, Venus enters Virgo at 1.48 p.m. and will stay in Virgo until October 27th. So you'll get a Venus in Libra by Halloween. So these are some Venus and Virgo related pleasures that I've noticed based on Venus and Virgo seasons past, as well as people that have this placement. There's finding beauty through organization, functional art, herbalism. Herbalism is such a Venusian and Virgoan thing. It's, um, I think of Virgo as the portal through the earth plane that leads into heavenly experience like heaven is on earth there isn't a split but we do experience the split in the mind and in society and in thought over the centuries um, and herbalism there's a way that these plant products it's not just the physicality and the physical properties of the herbs, but it's the magic that went into the making of the product or the herbalist's relationship to the plant. And so you get this kind of magical sense that comes through. Um, I think people that are, you know, have a green thumb are really good with plants, feels like a Venus and Virgo energy. You have to be conscientious and tuned in. Um, plants will, you know, show you what they need, I guess, by if they're wilting or whatever, but to be tuned into that um, and to cultivate that physical plane around you is a very Virgoan thing, but to do it in a beautiful way, Venus and Virgo. There's things like learning how to make more complex cuisine and enjoying um, finer cuisine. Um, so something that, you know, is like a new, new cooking skill or something, something that's a little bit more complicated connoisseurship in general, craft, art theory and analysis. So picking it apart, understanding it by breaking it into pieces. Engaging the process of refining one's taste, which is what we've been talking about. And I'm, you know, I'm inspired by this open and clothes book, which is all about refining one's taste. Um, so that process of getting particular about what you like. And there's a cooler or a chillier quality to this Venus placement. She is capable of being impressed, but she's harder to impress. She's also quite independent and enjoys her own company, which at times can make her not want for much in terms of relationship with others. She does connect, but she's more particular and selective. So, I mean, even just for data on the self, feeling into how you connect with that energy, what you think about it. One thing to consider is that if we look outward to others while avoiding cultivating our own lives, we may feel ourselves wanting. So when your room is a mess and you're focused outward, um, which happens, it's not to be, you know, say to be perfect, but just tuning into, are there ways that I'm not showing up for myself and going to the external? And how much more self-sufficient would I feel? Or how much more, how would the quality of my relationships change if I cultivated and tended to these things in my life? So Venus and Virgo can be a reminder to check in with ourselves about our self-care, our self-development, and how we're allocating space and time to the maintenance of daily life, as well as the creation of pleasure and esteem in daily life.
Venus in Virgo is a pretty conscientious Venus placement. Um, others' preferences and needs are taken into account more intricately. Venus in Virgo remembers the little things, people's dietary preferences and allergies, requests that people made months ago. You know, it's a very thoughtful energy. This placement can also emphasize apologizing. We might consider our relationship to apology. Um, and our most, hum our most humble approaches to it. The refusal to apologize or excessive self-deprecation um, are both extremes that come from a sense of blame or wrongness. What's an apology that's more like aloe to a burn? An apology that is a restoration of harmony. What is an apology that is based on mutual respect? And just to, yeah, segue to this image. <laughs> this is um, on October 4th, Pluto will station direct in 22 degrees of Capricorn at 6.32 a.m. Pacific. And Pluto stations, I've observed this for years, of just like when Pluto is stationing, it's a plutonic mood. It relates to a kind of viscous, thick, stormy energy. Um, and this can be juicy, like this can be rich. Pluto actually means wealth and riches. So it's like the contents of the soul. But it can also be kind of like tar, sticky. Um, the images or moods that life presents us with may feel more provocative than usual. Um, or we may feel more affected than usual. Um, I don't, like, I feel at this point, like, Pluto stations feel holotropic, or they feel, like, psychedelic. They feel, like, altered, where life is happening, but everything feels, like, more layered or more intense, which gives me pause. I usually know, because I track the transits, that it's Pluto stationing, and... I can just kind of sit with the intensity and be with it and do, you know, a general MO of mine is not to get overly involved um, in situations that are best not engaged with, like getting um, into all the hooks, you know, and getting tangled when it's not necessary. Um, Pluto actually is a planet that's taught me a lot about um, intentional involvement and intentional engagement. So Pluto does relate to intimacy and it relates to this um, attraction that we have towards toxicity, like when we're just hypnotically compelled to something that's really unhealthy for us and we don't know why, um, there's some kind of psychological hooking there. So for me, uh, with Pluto as very central to my practice with astrology and my personal practice, um, I work to notice these hooks and choose fully, as fully as possible, when I engage and not just compulsively engage with life. So when Pluto's stationing, um, that comes up for me even more of just seeing situations play out and be like, hmm, like, I could, you know, I'm like, what does this mean? What's arising in me? Why am I having this reaction versus just having the reaction and externalizing it and creating like a storm? So notice this week, if you feel that kind of storminess, that viscous kind of energy and tune into um, some self-reflection and contemplation about why, why something's getting to you. I think Pluto really draws us to our inner mysteries. So these are powerful times with Pluto stationing to be more contemplative and alchemical in presence than we are reactive. So also inspired by that recent conversation with Julie Hahn on the podcast, The Alchemy of Non-Anxious Presence. There are many ways to be alchemical. Some examples, creativity that works with what's up for us, regardless of whether it's okay, beautiful, um, that's really powerful. Like when you're making art or expressing yourself and you're like, oh, this is ugly. Like, what is this? Like, and really kind of like 
working with that material. Intuitive movement. So same thing, like playing out in your body exactly how you're feeling. Doesn't have to be pretty either. Acts of catharsis in a supportive container, it's Capricorn. And there is a way too that like we don't, our psyche protects us for the most part. And we don't exceed our own limits without having some kind of crisis or breakdown or something like that. And so because the psyche is kind of monitoring like, ooh, like this is my boundary of like how much intense transformation I can have at once, um, we'll stay in that. But then you have like a really supportive container. Say it's like a ritual space and there's a guide that you really trust. You might go deeper than you normally would because you have that safety of the container. So in general, you know, whether it's this week or not, if we're wanting to transform or exceed our own limitations, sometimes we have to find the right environment or create that within ourselves. One of my favorite practices is visualization and imagination and visualization is a way that I stretch the boundaries of my mind, what I believe is possible, who I believe I am. And so that's my container, you know, like my schema of who I am, but expanding it through visualization. You could create and perform a private ritual. I think this one is fun. Um, a lot of us have this concept that ritual has to be this prescribed thing and you like do it by this book, you know, but you can totally make up a ritual. You can um, create a physical space or like a circle and decide that when you get into the circle, you're in this like trance state or something and like walk over the threshold. You can just invent games and play them and play in that kind of ritual way. Um, opens up possibilities in the psyche and are magical, um, even if you're just making it up. There may be certain traditions around magic where you need to be more careful about what you're doing, but um, if you're just playing and you're making something up on your own, I think it's generally, you know, follow your intuition, do what feels right. But if you're messing with energies that you don't fully have an initiation with, you know, don't do that, <laughs> I guess. Um, singing is a, can be an alchemical experience. Visualization, which I mentioned, I forgot that I write that, wrote that. Um, or fully accepting where we are instead of resisting it. Um, as long as we're resisting something, it's hard to change. And so part of the, um, the alchemy, part of the change that you can experience is full acceptance of what's currently happening. And that makes way for the next thing to unfold. So this is what I've got for you. Sign up for my mailing list if you want to receive these forecasts in written form and the links to the YouTube videos every week. And um, I'll leave the link in the notes, the description or whatever it's called. Um, what else do I want to tell you? Definitely comment. Let me know what you thought. And um, do get in touch with me if you're interested in personal mentorship. I would love to talk to you about your goals um, and what you're working toward. So I hope that you have a beautiful week and um, feel the kind of soulful riches of this Pluto station and feel the self-gnosis of who you are and finding the beauty um, and the esteem in exactly who you are um, in reference to your own self. As in, we come here kind of with a blueprint, like our natal chart or other systems, you know, if we talk about palmistry or um, human design or any of these systems that answer this question of like, who am I? What's my fate? We come here with this kind of blueprint. Um, the acorn turns into an oak tree. Like there's a quality of inherentness within the self and understanding exactly what that is, is really powerful. And something that 
from a fire sign perspective, it's like the joy of life, that question of, you know, special destiny. And with an Aries full moon conjunct Chiron, I think that it's kind of the vibe of really tuning into what is that blueprint for you? What's, who are you? Um, and I would say, come to me for a reading if you want some feedback, but get on my mailing list to find out when my books open up again, because um, I do love reading charts. I'm just um, booked at the moment. So I hope that you have a beautiful week and I'll catch you next time.